Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. For indeed, you are our rock, our redeemer, and our shepherd. Amen. I have a question for you. Do you hear a theme in today's service? <laughs> I mean, did you hear a theme in our children doing their beautiful anthem and our choir and in the scripture and in the call to worship and in the prayers? Do you hear a theme? Well, I want to share with you how this all came about. Meg and I were planning a funeral, and she mentioned that Howard Goodall's version of The Lord is My Shepherd, which the choir just sang for us so beautifully, would be appropriate. So I asked her to sing it, and she did. Now, instead of my reaction being, oh, Meg, that was so lovely, so moving, so heartfelt, I responded with an enthusiastic, that is the opening song to my favorite Britcom, The Vicar of Dibley. <laughs> the show's main character, Geraldine Granger, is a lovable and raucous parish priest in the Church of England, and she is this girl preacher's hero. <laughs> well, Meg smiles like she does, and she patiently listened to me. And then eventually I said, yes, Meg, please sing it. Now, several months down the road, the preaching schedule comes out, and I am assigned to preach today, April 30th. And Meg is like, Pam, do you know what the psalm reading is for that Sunday? Do you know? Do you know? I said, no, Meg, I don't. She said, it's the 23rd Psalm. The choir can sing, good alls, the Lord is my shepherd, as the anthem. And I responded that time with a truly heartfelt and excited, Meg, that will be awesome. And it was. Now fast forward a wee bit. And I'm beginning the process of studying today's scripture when it dawns on me, oh no. You just agreed to preach the 23rd Psalm. Oh Lord, what have you done? I mean, is there any more that anybody can say about one of the most famous passages in the Hebrew Bible? I mean, the 23rd Psalm is known by many people, particularly in that poetic language of the King James Version. And it's sung in many languages and set to a variety of music styles across the centuries. It's been the source of inspiration for countless paintings and prints. And I am very confident that there are not enough fingers and toes in this sanctuary to count the number of sermons preached on it. Psalm 23 is often read at funerals and memorial services because it points to God's providing, protecting, and peace-giving presence. It provides encouragement, comfort. And for those who mourn, it's that final phrase of verse 6, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's comforting, not only because it speaks about the resting place of their loved one, but it is heard as a promise of the eternal rest that they will experience in the future. It is a promise that death does not and never will have the final word. 
It's a beautiful promise of heaven. It's a forward-leaning and future-looking, hope-filled promise. And there's certainly nothing, nothing wrong with looking to the future with a sense of hope. I mean, it's essential to the decision-making process if we want to experience progress. And of course, there's certainly nothing wrong with looking for God's guidance toward and in the future. Because that too is essential. If we want to experience the future God has planned for us, But what happens? What happens if we think of the 23rd Psalm as a game plan for living today? What happens if we hear Psalm 23 as a proclamation of trust in God's active presence in the here and now? What if we come back to Psalm 23 day after day. <clears throat> the psalmist begins the proclamation of the psalm with, the Lord is my shepherd. It sums up the nature of the relationship. And the psalmist isn't choosing just any old garden variety God of the Near East as their shepherd. They choose Yahweh, the God of Israel. I am who I am, the eternally existent one. They choose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses that freed his people from slavery in Egypt and led them into the promised land. There's a sense that the psalmist doesn't just have head knowledge of God, but a heartfelt personal experience of and trust in God. Throughout history, Psalm 23 is associated with David. And certainly, the psalm seems to invoke many of the key moments in David's history. And a reading of the historical books of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament reveal that David knew a little something about trust. He trusted Saul, and it led to threats on his life. David broke trust when he had an affair with another man's wife and then had that man murdered. And David knew the pain, the pain of a child breaking trust in order to grab power. But King David also knew about trust, trust in God. In his youth, David trusted that God would protect him from that giant Goliath and that five stones and a sling were enough. He trusted that God would protect him in the relentless pursuit of his enemies. And it was with a humble spirit and a broken heart that he confessed his sin of adultery and trusted in God's forgiveness and mercy. Scripture also says that David tended his daddy's flock. So associating God's attributes and activities with that of a shepherd made sense in David's world. When you hear the word shepherd, what comes to mind? Do you imagine a, a picturesque scene of rolling hills and green meadows dotted with sheep and that attentive shepherd standing nearby? When I uh, traveled to Israel, I saw sheep everywhere, and I mean everywhere. 
They were in fields, they were in front yards, they were hauled in the back of every other truck on the highway. I even saw a flock of sheep in a parking lot in Jerusalem. In 2023, there are over 9 million sheep in the country of Israel. And with those abundance of sheep, there has to be a shepherd. And that attentive shepherd still has the same job as the shepherds we read about in the Bible. They have the responsibility of protecting the flock. They're responsible for guiding the flock to adequate sources of, of water and food. The shepherd is the one held accountable for tending to the flock's need for ongoing rest and care. So, in the act of remembering the attributes and activities of God and the faith that it stirs and strengthens, the psalmist is able to acknowledge that they are a sheep. They are a sheep in need of the continual care of the shepherd. And they need a shepherd they can trust. The psalmist chooses God. Think a minute. When it comes to caring for us, whom do we trust and choose? Trust is defined as a, a firm belief in the re reliability, the truth, the ability or strength of someone or something. I did a little research on this notion of trust. And the folks at Tidemark Therapy Group say, as humans, we're hardwired to connect with others and trust others. And without that connection, we would not be able to survive. We thrive off of one another and learn and grow with one another. And beyond the simple fact that it's important for a healthy relationship, there are other reasons. When we are capable and we trust, we have a sense that we have a reliable support system and we can effectively face challenges and we're capable of more trust when we trust we're less lonely when we trust we're more authentic we allow people to get to know us when we trust we don't have to hide who we are and in that there's a beautiful sense of peace. And trusting gives us a more positive view of the world. Now, desiring a genuine feeling of trust in someone or something is natural. We know it. And the world outside knows it. There are folks vying for our attention and vying for their trust. It's announced everywhere. We hear some form of, you can trust us. From everything to insurance companies and, yes, politicians. And sometimes we find that our trust in businesses, institutions, and individuals is warranted because they are reliable. And at other times, when our trust is betrayed, we're devastated. Psalm 23 reminds us that we can live out the moments of the day and all they hold because God is present with us. We can trust God. Now, I know for some folks, 
it's hard to focus on the now because we live in a get ahead, get it done, be prepared culture. And as a recovering type A, I'm looking at Meg, <laughs> she's one too. As a recovering type A, I can tell you, my brain is always thinking about the next thing to do. Our minds are racing ahead and, and planning for the next thing. Plan for the future, plan for college, plan for your next career move, plan for retirement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying we shouldn't plan. Now, I am planning on retiring many, many, many years down the road. And I'm going to be honest with you. The last thing I want to have to do is live in a tent on some old United Methodist preacher's retirement compound. <laughs> that would be about as much fun as having a perpetual toothache. My point is this. We often miss out on the joy of today because we're so preoccupied with tomorrow. So what if we did this? What if we took a breath? Put down that mental to-do list. Acknowledge God's presence with us now. Acknowledge the gift of the moment. And if we ponder anything, let it be truth of the evidence of God's love and mercy found in our experience and memories of God's past action. God was our faithful shepherd yesterday. And God is our faithful shepherd today. God will provide, protect, and restore us. And God will guide us to what God knows we need today. God, our shepherd, leads us through everyday life. And everyday life has moments of beauty, and joy for us to experience. But everyday life includes moments of walking through the valley of the shadow of death, or as it's said in Hebrew, deepest darkness. We cannot avoid it. The experience of deepest darkness is known to each of us. It's true in my own life. This darkness is not where we want to be or what we want to experience it. And nobody would willingly choose to go through it. It's painful. It's lonely, and it's unpleasant. But Psalm 23 reminds us today that we dwell in the presence of God. We do not walk through darkness alone. God is with us. God provides for us. God holds, comforts, and encourages us. And God leads us through it. I, I find in my own life that God is, leads me through these moments of deepest darkness through the prayers and the support and the love and the encouragement of others. And I'm so grateful. And that we spend time on Psalm 23 during this Easter season is fitting. In the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus claim, I am the good shepherd, 
And then he goes on to state, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus, the good shepherd, willingly sacrificed himself so that his flock could live free of the power of sin and death. And Jesus, that good shepherd, got out of that tomb and he gathered his flock. And over the centuries, that flock has grown because Jesus continues to call all of his sheep. And that good shepherd, he keeps that gate open. And he continues to extend and invite all who hear his voice to enter into a big pasture and to dwell with him. And in this pasture, love, grace, and mercy overflow. Beloved, Jesus, the good shepherd, is calling to us. So let's listen for his voice and respond to it. He leads us, so let's follow. Let's follow in trust and with obedience. And in doing these things, we will experience, as the hymn says, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. In the name of God, the Creator, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and Good Shepherd, and the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer. Amen.